we will continue with fun and interesting applications of electromagnetic induction. Let's start by thinking about this situation. We've talked about it a little bit already. But if we have a magnet and we move it down toward a loop of wire, and I'm just going to draw my loop of wire as a cross section. So we've got a magnet moving down toward a loop of wire. What's going to happen as that magnet moves down toward the loop of wire? The magnet fills the space ahead of it with a magnetic field. And as it gets closer and closer to that loop of wire, more and more of those field lines are penetrating the loop of wire. So the flux is increasing but it's toward the bottom of the page. So a current gets set up in my loop of wire out of the page on this side and into the page on the other side. The current gets set up to oppose this change. It wants to create its own magnetic field pointing up toward the top of the page. That means I could redraw this. I could have my magnet coming down and instead of a loop of wire, that loop of wire acts like a little electromagnet. And what direction is it oriented? With a north pole up. So what happens here? They repel or the falling magnet, the magnet that's moving down, its motion is slowed down by its interaction with the loop. Now let's allow our magnet to continue to fall. So we had this situation, right? We had a magnet, we had a loop of wire, and the magnet was coming down toward the loop of wire, and we saw what happened. Now we're going to allow that magnet to pass completely through the loop of wire and continue to fall down below the loop of wire like this. So now our loop of wire is above the falling magnet. What does the magnetic field look like from this magnet? It points toward the South Pole. And as the magnet moves farther and farther away, the field is getting weaker and weaker. So a current is set up in that loop of wire to try to add to the field. That means my falling magnet looks like that, same as it does in the real situation. And my loop of wire actually behaves like a little electromagnet. But this time, the north end is down. It has switched polarity. And what do I get here? An attractive force. What does that do? it slows the falling magnet. In both cases, the motion of the magnet was hindered or reduced by its interaction with the loop. As it falls down toward the loop, a repulsive force slows it down and prevents it from falling too fast. And after it goes through the loop, it's attracted, which slows it down and prevents it from falling too fast. Let's take a look at this video demonstration, which shows this effect. I have a short length of copper pipe and a penny. When I drop the penny, it falls and hits the table in a very short amount of time. Even going through the copper pipe, it falls in about the same amount of time. Here I have a very strong magnet. First I'll show you that copper is non-magnetic. A magnet will not stick to it. 
but dropping it through the copper pipe, it takes much longer than the penny. Let's drop both together. Once more in slow motion. This is the same demonstration but using an aluminum track instead of a copper pipe. First I'll drop the penny and you can see it slides down very quickly. This is a strong magnet. Aluminum doesn't stick to a magnet. But when I release it, it slides very slowly compared to the penny. As you can see, it doesn't stick to aluminum. It drops right off the track at the bottom. And one more time in slow motion. As you saw in the video, this worked for a magnet dropping down through a copper pipe because what is a copper pipe? It's a whole bunch of little rings of wire put together to form a solid. Same thing as the magnet falling toward a loop of wire. We also saw this effect take place when the magnet was just sliding down a sheet of aluminum. It's the same effect. There's a name for this effect. It's called an eddy current. Eddy, E-D-D-Y, is the same term that's used in streams when these small currents form on the edges of streams that are flowing water. So the eddy currents are small electrical currents that form in our conductors due to the interaction with the magnetic field. So let's take a look. Let's turn the situation uh, sideways here. We'll have a magnetic field coming perpendicular to the page. So we have a magnetic field confined to this region of my page. And I'm going to move a conductor into this region of space. I'll make it a pendulum. So if I let go of this pendulum and allow it to swing, down into this region of magnetic field. What happens is we have it coming from a region with no magnetic field into a re region with the magnetic field. And the magnetic field is pointing into the page. So the flux in this part of our conductor is increasing into the page. A conductive material, it's a solid conductor, but it acts no different than a loop of wire does. We have an increasing flux. A current is going to get set up to try to oppose that change. So we're going to get a current that's set up in this direction. Now we have a current moving toward the top of our page for the most part, right here in this section. And that current is in a magnetic field. It's going to feel a force. What direction is the force on that current? To the left. Remember, the current on the other side is outside of the magnetic field region, so it doesn't feel a force. Only the current that's in the region with the magnetic field feels this force. That force slows down the moving conductor. And it doesn't matter whether it's moving into the magnetic field or out, just like we saw with the dropping magnet earlier. Didn't matter if it was moving toward the loop of wire or away from it. Its motion was hindered either way. The same is true here. If I make my pendulum swing out the other side, where this pendulum is swinging in this direction, the magnetic flux is getting reduced as the, the conductor moves out of the magnetic field region. So a current is going to get set up to try to increase it. 
we have a current moving in the magnetic field. What direction is the force? To the left, slowing down our moving conductor. It doesn't matter whether it's moving into the region of magnetism or out of the magnetic field region. The force slows it down either way. And these currents, these small loops of current that are forming here, one over here, one over here, those are called eddy currents. And just to convince you, let's see this in a video demonstration. This pendulum is made from a thin sheet of aluminum. Since it's aluminum, it's an electrical conductor, but it does not stick to magnets. I also have a strong magnet. We'll position this strong magnet so the pendulum can swing through it without touching it. Stop the video and predict what's going to happen when we release the pendulum. Three, two, one. Let's watch that one more time. Now let's rotate the setup 90 degrees and take a look from this angle. As you can see, the pendulum swings through without touching the magnet. Now we'll modify the pendulum by taking it to a saw and cutting slots in it like you see here. Let's try this new pendulum and see what happens to it. Without the magnet in place, it's free to swing back and forth just as the other pendulum did. Now we'll put that strong magnet in place so the pendulum can swing through it without touching it. Stop the video and predict what's going to happen this time. Three, two, one. The result is slightly different this time. We'll rotate the apparatus by 90 degrees and take a look from this angle. Now we'll make another modification to our pendulum. We'll connect the bottoms of those slots so they don't go all the way out to the end. They're confined within the pendulum. So those are connected together at the bottom. This pendulum will also swing back and forth freely without the magnet in place. We'll position that strong magnet, stop the video, and predict what's going to happen when we release this pendulum. Three, two, one. Very similar to the solid pendulum, isn't it? Let's put the solid pendulum back on and take a look at that again. And the pendulum with the connected slots one more time. As we saw in the video, when we had a solid conductor and there was an ability to form fairly large eddy currents, we got a large force and a big effect. But when we cut these notches into our solid conductor, it really affected the ability to form large eddy currents. We could still get small 
currents to form within the conductive material. But there was no way to form a large eddy current because there was no path there. It was physically cut out. So we got a very small effect. But when we connected the bottom like this, it enabled large eddy currents to form again. So we could get currents forming around the holes that were cut in the conductor. And that enabled large forces to act, and we could see a big effect again. Eddy currents. What can you do with eddy currents? Well, you may have gotten the idea that they are good for braking, for slowing something down. One application is in a roller coaster, where you don't want to rely on something uh, mechanical or electrical that has to slow your roller coaster car down. You can set up permanent magnets on the track and a metal fin on the roller coaster car that goes by the magnets, and you always get this braking effect. So roller coasters often use eddy current brakes. Another application is for damping a triple beam balance. When you weigh something out on a balance, you want to wait until that balance is perfectly level, and then you know you've got a reading there. And oftentimes it's teeter-tottering back and forth and back and forth, and you're waiting, and the makers of the balance want to be able to damp that so it quickly finds its equilibrium and stops moving. What they do is put a little magnet inside on this end, and there's a metal aluminum fin in there that moves back and forth in front of that magnet. Here's an actual picture of a balance, and you can kind of catch a glimpse of that aluminum fin, and somewhere inside there's a magnet stuck to the wall there on the inside of that support. As it goes up and down, those eddy currents feel that force opposing the motion, the motion is damped, and the balance quickly comes to rest. Another example of electromagnetic induction is RFID. You hear about these all the time. Some people get their pets chipped. A little chip is left under the skin of your pet, and with a special reader, you can get a number from that, and if your pet gets out and gets away, somebody finds them, a vet can take their reader, get the number, and figure out that the pet belongs to you. So your dog, if he escapes, can find his way home using one of these RFID tags. And they're used in all kinds of things. A lot of times when you work at a company where they have doors that are locked and you have a card that can open them, those work with RFID. I'm told they're even in my garbage cans. And when the city truck comes by and the arms come down over my garbage can, it reads the garbage can and it uh, tells it it belongs to my house and that uh, I've paid my bill, I guess, and they take my garbage. So RFID, let's take a look at this video, a closer look at RFID. A lot of companies use ID cards like this, so you can scan them and get past locked doors. Or maybe you're familiar with a fob to get into your car. These are types of RFID. There's a coil of wire inside that gets energized by the card reader through electromagnetic induction. It provides power to that little chip so no battery is needed. The chip sends a signal back to the card reader. And electromagnetic induction is how speakers and microphones work. A speaker is basically a cone that can vibrate in and out. What is a sound wave? It's a vibration that gets propagated through the air or through any medium, maybe a solid or a liquid, but usually we listen to things through the air. And our speaker 
vibrates. That cone you see on this image vibrates in and out and it pushes on the air molecules and they push on their neighbors and they push on their neighbors and eventually air molecules push on your eardrum and you perceive that as sound. Well, how do we get this to vibrate really quickly to make the sounds that we want to create? We stick a little magnet on the back side of this cone here. There's a little magnet on the stuck on the back side of that cone. And if you look underneath, what do you see? A coil of wire. And so you hook up your electrical connection and it runs a current through that coil of wire and it either attracts the magnet or it repels the magnet. And that's how the cone vibrates in and out. A speaker works in basically the exact same way, except it's a very sensitive diaphragm. When the air molecules hit it, it moves a tiny bit in and out, and there's a magnet on the back side of that diaphragm and a coil of wire that senses the changing magnetic flux and generates an EMF. And that EMF is amplified, and that's how a microphone works. So basically, speakers and microphones are the same as far as the physics is concerned. Another application is storing information magnetically. Have you ever wondered why, when you use your credit card at the gas station or at the supermarket, you have to swipe it? When you put it into the gas station, it says remove card quickly. Swiping, removing the card quickly, scanning, sliding. There has to be motion because the information is stored in a magnetic stripe magnetically. And the magnet has to pass over a coil. There has to be a changing magnetic flux that it can read. So the magnetic stripe on the back of that card has a series of north and south poles. And a north pole up might be a one, and a south pole up might be a zero. Remember, it's storing information in binary, ones and zeros. So you can create a number by having lots of little magnetic poles, and you have to scan that. The reader has a little pickup coil in it. As you scan your card across the pickup coil, the magnetic fields change up, down, down, up, and the EMF that's generated in the loop can detect whether it's a one or a zero, whether it's a north up or a south up. Of course, our credit cards are moving away from magnetic stripes they have a chip embedded in them. That's a different mechanism. But a lot of cards, including credit cards and driver's license and uh, library cards and all kinds of things still use this magnetic stripe. What about this object on the right? Have you seen one of those before? That's a cassette tape that also stores information magnetically. The magnetic tape gets magnetized, so we have a magnetic pole that points up or down. Basically storing ones and zeros. And that tape moves. Those wheels turn and the tape gets moved. And there's a sensing coil underneath. And the changing magnetic flux can be detected in that coil as an EMF. And that information can be sped into a speaker to make it play sound. Do you buy that? Do you believe that this information is stored magnetically on that tape? Well, if you don't, I've got a demonstration for you. If you've been to a museum recently, maybe you've seen one of these. It's a cassette. It stores information magnetically on that tape. The cassette goes into the tape player. And as that magnetic ribbon or tape passes across the pickup head, the magnetic signal is transformed back to sound. 
I'm going to play some music out of my phone. As soon as I plug in the headphone jack, it cuts off the music. But you can see my headphone jack isn't connected to a normal headphone. It's connected to this nail. That's an ordinary nail I picked up off the floor of my garage, and the wire is wrapped around it and soldered together. I'm going to hold that nail over the pickup head on my cassette player and play my music from my cell phone through the nail into the pickup head on the cassette player and out that speaker you see right there. Let's listen. Do you understand what just happened there? To show you that the information is stored magnetically and picked up by that pickup head, I just created a magnetic field using the output from my phone. It thinks it's playing to a speaker because what does it do in a speaker? It runs a little current that causes a magnet to move in and out and create sound. So instead of having the magnet in the speaker, I just ran the current over a nail. What does the nail do? It intensifies the magnetic field that's being created. And that magnetic field is picked up by the pickup head. So instead of getting a magnetic signal from a cassette tape, it's getting it from the nail that's getting it from the speaker output on my phone. And that goes in to the cassette player, and the cassette player then sends an electrical signal to a speaker, which causes a magnet to move, which creates sound. I think that might be my favorite demonstration.